Welcome. I'm Thelma Golden and thrilled to be here to moderate the panel Confronting History, Changing the Narrative as part of the State of the Art 2020 Summit. Thank you all for being here with us. I am so glad to be joined by my dear friends and colleagues on this panel who I know are gonna offer us amazing insight today. They are Naomi Beckwith, the Manilow Senior Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Nick Cave, artist and cultural visionary based in Chicago, and Chan A. Noriega, the director of UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center in Los Angeles. Hello to you all. Hi, Hi. Hi. So in this session, we have come together to think about the idea of confronting history and changing the narrative. And I think all of you in your work as thinkers and believers have done that, have exemplified what it means to confront history and also to change the narrative. So I wanted to start First, Nick, with you, uh, amazing artist who also just opened an exhibition at The Momentary, curated by Lauren Haynes, titled Until. And I think in that exhibition and through your work generally, you have engaged deeply in this idea of confronting history, but also not just changing the narrative, but creating new narratives. Can you tell us about how this frames and figures into your artistic practice. Yes, uh, you know, with until, and I think within my sort of uh, practice, I think what has shifted is I have sort of found myself uh, asking uh, the question of purpose and how do I become more purposeful in my practice. And what does that mean? What does that look like? And I think over time, I have found myself sort of uh, being really this artist with, with this mindset of civic responsibility. And so I have sort of been finding myself sort of creating these sort of projects that become spaces for engagement. Uh, may it be a town hall, may it be uh, young people gathering, uh, and spaces that allow us to feel safe to talk about uh, these difficult uh, issues and concerns we may have but putting them in this sort of space of optimism and hope. Thank you, thank you. And I have to ask you if you could just meditate a bit on the exhibition itself, because of course, we all have been pleased to th see images of it, but can you speak about in this moment what it has meant to present a major work of art? You know, it's interesting this moment, because. Uh, is interesting because until really came about, it came out of the Michael Brown incident. And so, although I knew that it was going to be in Bentonville, uh, but it was interesting when uh, George Floyd happened and I was just sort of in this sort of space in my head, like I need to be in until right now. And so it was this sort of sense of urgency because I knew the impact of what that project has done for community, uh, for individuals, and the need to have that accessible was critical. I, you know, it was it, for me. It was all about taking action, and what does that mean? How how do we as artists? You know, I think there's always been. Um, black art movements, but how do we as artists sort of take action in the moment of despair? Mm, it's beautiful. Action in the moment of despair. Naomi, could you reflect for us as a curator on the role and resonance of history, not only in your understanding um, of artist practice, 
but also in curatorial practice? Um, I mean, that is a large question, Thelma, and thank you for it. You know, there's multiple ways in which we could approach that. One of the ways that I think about it a lot is what does it mean to follow an artist as they approach history? And I, as many people may know, uh, work primarily with artists of African descent, um, very much encouraged and I think inspired by artists who have been trying to offer to their audiences another view of the world that they think they knew. Um, remembering my first encounter at the museum that I work at now, BMCA Chicago, where I came across a work by, um, by Adrian Piper called Cornered. And in that work, Adrian Piper is on a television screen speaking to an, uh, to an audience. And Adrienne is looking at that screen, so delightful, so beautiful, so wonderfully. And then all of a sudden she speaks and she says, I'm black. And this was a shock to many people in the audience, I remember upon first seeing that work. But I also remember Adrienne beginning to tell the story of her understanding of American history, which is one by which a woman like her, who is very light complected, uh, can, st can be mistaken as white, but is still African-American in her cultural understanding and history. And she had to narrate that history for her audiences in a way that I realized was a surprise for many people. Um, it wasn't a secret to me. I don't think it's a secret to many people of color in this country. But it occurred to me that the work that she was doing was sort of filling in the gaps of an education or lack thereof for an audience. And I realized that maybe my position as a curator was one that could help allow that kind of work to go forward, allow artists to kind of step in that gap and give us these alternate histories, especially around an American story that we're reckoning with right now. Thank you. I think reckoning is a, a good word to characterize um, a feeling and a mood of the moment, but it's also um, an amazing way to think about the work that you have done, Sean. And in many ways, that sort of framing a uh, sentence that is our panel's title, which looks at confronting history, changing the narrative, that is what your work has been so reason it's been so emblematic right you have confronted history you confronted history's exclusions history's mistakes history's lies and you've changed the narrative by creating new narratives right allowing us to understand parallel histories in deep and profound ways so could you chan as a historian and a thinker but also as i know a deep 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 um imaginer of time and space through thought. Can you talk about the role history can play in our understanding of these changing narratives in their necessity, but the role that you as a public intellectual and a historian have played around these ideas? I don't know if I can say it any better than what you've outlined, except uh, to really start with the title of this panel, uh, Confronting the Past. And I think what's important if one takes up that challenge is to first of all accept that the past is not a thing. Uh, it is not a, a, an object or a beast or something that is there as a coherent entity. It is really the multiplicity of everything that has happened. And so when we talk about the history we're confronting, what we're confronting are stories that have been made and maintained and passed on. And we often think of museums in that context um, as, as children. Uh, it's the death march we're taken on uh, to go into the museum and encounter paintings uh, that come from a history and that also are the first draft of narrating uh, that history. Um, and I think that once we see it that way, we realize uh, the past isn't past. It is continually with us. We are continually using an idea of the past, certain stories of the past, to create an argument about what our society is or what we are as a people or a, as a species. Um, and just as there's a telling, there's also an erasing and a silencing that goes on. 
And it's not that those histories aren't there. They happened. The traces of them are all around us. But they haven't been accepted as part of the story that is being told uh, through the mass media, through journalism, uh, through museums, and through the curriculum uh, in school from the time kids are four or five years old. And so I just want to, I think it's important to connect what, uh, you know, what Nick said about a space to talk. It's not a space to learn or, or to have something kind of pushed at you, but a space to talk. And then, you know, what Naomi said is the, the other end of that, to the idea of following an artist as they do what they do, as they engage with some of the questions that are operative within their moment in the art world, within society, but also as they engage with what they see are elements of the past that are very much with us but there's so much there, they're like the air. We don't really see them as a construct, as a framing, as an exclusion. And as a scholar, as a, as a curator, as somebody who uh, truly loves talking with artists, uh, I think it's just, it's, it's crucial to be able to have that view and to understand what the stakes are in terms of uh, what happens in the museum world, not as something that's separate from or that's aspirational and set above us, but one of the on the ground institutions uh, that help perpetuate certain stories that don't serve everyone very well. And for me, just to, to conclude, uh, you know, I, I'm a first generation college uh, graduate, uh, but my parents would take me to museums every weekend uh, and they would show me this work that had never been part of their education. And as I was educated, uh, I could see that where I come from uh, and the history that is part of this United States was never really reflecting back. Other things were, and they, they could be quite fascinating, but it just wasn't there. And so I feel like in my project, it's uh, it's... Uh, it's a combination of bringing things to the surface that have always been there, that are still here, while challenging the constructs, uh, the professional codes and culture that perpetuate that exclusion. Yeah, thank you for that. I'd love to ask you a follow-up to that, Chan, because oh, could sure. you, as a curator and a scholar, then maybe put terms around what that challenge means because in, in many ways, the topic of this panel, we could speak about hypothetically and theoretically, but we could also cite it in this very moment, right? In mm -hmm. a moment that where we are understanding history in the most complex ways. So can you talk about the ways in which you particularly think art and artists, but also museums mm -hmm. allow a, not only a challenge, but a deeply necessary alternative to mm -hmm. these prevailing narratives? I'll start with something that happened last week when I, I was reading the Sunday New York Times. Um, they every now and then have a, a section that is a, a series of photo essays drawn from their archive. Now, the archive is, the photo archive is a visual history of the United States. They are the newspaper of record. And they were doing a, a, a section on the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. And I looked through it, and I saw all corners of the world except for one. And that was the U.S. Latino and Latin America. And it struck me, it reminded me of Ken Burns when he made a documentary. And apparently the onus of research was so profound that he could find no place for Mexican Americans. Even though if you Google Mexican American in World War II, you get hundreds of thousands of hits. And you immediately see that this is the most decorated group that fought in that war and that they have fought in every war this country has ever had. And that's the New York Times basically saying, here is the history that happened relative to World War II. And this is me reading it saying, we weren't part of it, uh, but I know we were, but everyone else doesn't. Right. And I think the same thing applies to a museum. The museum is in many respects an archive of our material culture. 
we give it that status as an archive because we're not only seeing things that represent the past, they are also artifacts of the past. And I think the potential there is to break that down, actually. And I think some of the most profound artists that I've worked with uh, throughout the Americas uh, are involved in a level of destruction. And they're often turning to the material culture itself as part of uh, the generations after the 50s that predominantly began to work with found objects. And these weren't just, you know, when you read history, uh, that movement from the late 50s to the early 60s is usually talked about in terms of consumer goods. These weren't consumer goods. This was objects of people's homes. And to take those objects and begin to break them down in ways that reveal how that object has in many ways structured pathways, uh, has limited our understanding of what's really happening in homes uh, and to the extent that we take a certain notion of the home, and all cultures do, you take a certain notion of the home as representative of that nation. So there's a big conflation between one person's home and an argument made about an entire nation of people. Uh, I had the, the, the honor of doing a show at, at the LA County Museum of Art as well as the Museum of Fine Arts Houston where we looked at uh, the history of artists since the 50s engaging with home by taking up that material culture and transforming it, mostly through destruction, in order to really bring to consciousness a lot of the underlying histories that had to do with authoritarian uh, regimes that had to do with the disappearance of citizens, that had to do with the massive creation of shanty towns in the wake of World War II as a consequence of economic development, uh, and that had to do with migration and also uh, with having a minority status in the United States, but being part of the majority population of the hemisphere. Uh, and it was fascinating to see artists like, uh, you know, uh, Doris Salcedo and Leila Cárdenas, who are two different generations of Colombian artists, working with the spaces and the objects of a home that was the beginning of a century of political instability. Uh, that the nation formation was the creation of instability. Uh, or Rafael Montañez Ortiz, a Puerto Rican artist, uh, who's one of the first people to really take up the project of uh, what, what he called archaeological finds, which is to like destroy the objects that you find, not reconstruct them into a seamless narrative about history. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that because I, I could go on and on. It, it's it's, it's a, a unique opportunity, I think, in, in the way that uh, you know Nick uh, mentioned, that uh, to come into the museum space with a different project, and not one of uh, seeing the gallery spaces as a, a part of the national project of transmitting a culture, but as a space to begin talking about breaking down and reassembling it in ways that match uh, the people that are in the room. So. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's amazing the way you frame that because in many ways it, it, it speaks to um, what this current uh, iteration of state of the art that's now up at Crystal Bridges feels like, right? Mm -hmm. Art is coming into the room um, exactly. and creating and yeah. writing these different narratives. But Nick, I would love for you to now consider this idea of history, but also storytelling. And in some ways in which Hans said, this idea of destruction as an act of creation, because your work is about the deep importance and alchemy of found objects. And it feels to me with that, that you are constantly allowing us to go back to the past right, and understand the meanings and the feelings that those objects evoke, but you're also creating something entirely new with them. How did that become uh, central to your practice and how does it define how you think about yourself as an artist? You know, I think about, uh, uh, number one, I am more than my history. And so for me, you know, the found object also speaks a lot about uh, being raised uh, lower middle class and uh, 
you know, not having a lot, but being sort of given sort of permission, given sort of space to be expressive, uh, to be creative uh, without judgment and being able to sort of be in that sort of space and recognizing that, you know, uh, there's substance, there's excess around me and that has Every, and everything has potential of being something else than what we know it was. And so for me, you know, I've always been interested in, you know, that object uh, being this sort of magnet that allows us all to engage in a place, in a time that we all can connect back to. And yet renegotiating its sort of position, renegotiating its power. You know, I think about, uh, you know, black power, my black power. And I think about why is my black power such a threat? Why is my black optimism such an interest? And I think about and yet I'm trying to get to black excellence. And so, you know, I'm sort of uh, balancing all of these sort of things all at once and trying to create this sort of space of otherness, this, sort of, this space of imagining a different type of existence, a different type of experience that I'm willing and openly uh, providing uh, and sharing. And so for me, you know, the sort of found object becomes that sort of catalyst. It becomes this, this sort of tool for us to have these, this sort of engagement and to be able to just to, to speak about history, to speak about a moment in time, but yet to sort of see it in this sort of future sort of state. Naomi, over these recent months, um, as a curator, I can imagine that you've been in conversations with artists. Can you offer us some perspective on how artists are thinking about in the kind of curatorial collaborative conversation with you this moment and can you predict into that about how we might understand the history of this moment through the works of art that are being made or even just beginning to be thought of right now yeah it's a really exceptional moment right now um, Thelma, you rightly point out. And if anything, I'd like to take a step back and maybe respond a little bit to um, something both Chan and Nick said as a preface to this, which is really to think afresh about artist strategies. We've been talking in many ways about how we present history in, in museums and in galleries. We've been talking a bit about how objects get worked through. And as I'm listening to these brilliant gentlemen talk about this, I realize, you know, there are multiple strands and strains by which artists have been working through all these questions. And one of them has been this really beautiful uh, recuperative gesture that Nick talks about. How do we bring something from a milieu that feels homely and familiar and particular and give it new power and new resonance with new audiences? Um, there are artists who often go into what I like to call the kind of archeological mode where, they, where they'll pull out artifacts and um, help reconstruct a history that seems to have been forgotten. Uh, right now I'm thinking, oh, I'm thinking actually particularly about the work right behind you, Gary Simmons' recent work with looking at early black cinema and making new beautiful paintings uh, based on this kind of lost archive of work. This archive work is really interesting. But it also occurred to me there's a third strategy, which is the one that is um, maybe casting doubt on objects altogether. And I'm remembering now a, a brilliant exhibition by Okwe and Weiser uh, called Archive Fever that he did at the International Center for Photography some years ago, where he not only showed artists who sort of took up those first two strategies I mentioned, but he also showed artists who said, maybe we need to 
uh, look askance and with some skepticism at history and the archive altogether. You know, the problem is some of that faith that we have in the archive. And, and I was fascinated, for instance, by a project by Sharon Lockhart, who just totally invented a blues musician uh, as part of her project. But the way that she recorded and made that entire project look so real, I wonder why hadn't I known about this woman before? Uh, when I look at uh, uh, Wally Rad in that show and how he has created an entire project that's a kind of invented history of uh, the Arab world, um, but the joke's on us because we don't know enough about history to know that a lot of this is made up. Then I think about ways in which artists want us to question our own uh, our own methods of coming into knowledge. But to speak more specifically about this particular moment, uh, what I've been most taken by in conversations with artists um, has been what feels like a move toward a more activist stance. And that there is a sense that we can't just look back at history and try to reconstruct it for people. We also have to affect the outcome of history. Um, clearly, we are in a moment, uh, especially in our national politics, but clearly in inter international politics where that feels necessary. Um, I'm interested in the way someone like Nan Golden was number two on the Art News Most Powerful list last year. And it was because she had an entire activist project, which was confronting the op opioid crisis and its intersection with institutions. Um, I'm thinking about the Black Lunch Table and the way in which many artists, other cultural practitioners, but mostly artists, have gotten together alongside their sort of fine art practice to really reinscribe stories of other Black artists in into the public arena, into our public narratives via Wikipedia. But I'm also thinking about artists like Marilyn Minter, who has decided that she's going to take a break from all of her studio practice right now. And she's going to work on what she believes is necessary, necessary change for the political system. These kind of strategies of both uh, somehow addressing history, but now trying to affect history going forward is really fascinating for me at this moment right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's you know fascinating when you bring up this idea of artist as activist, um, because we can broaden that and just say sort of creative thinker as activist, because that's perhaps where there is an important and deep pressure point to impacting what a future can be. You know, I often think of what becomes so important to me about art generally, but what I've really held so dear in my relationship to um, artists of African descent and the work of black artists is the space at which it is always about a future imagining. Um, you know, Nick brought that up in his comments and Sean has given us that as a charge and thinking about when we talk about change, but this idea of a future imagining allowing us to see what does not exist, allowing that to then become the sort of goal, the aspiration. I'd love each of you to talk about the role of memory, and we can think about that in the personal, in its relationship to history, which we might think about as something we hold, right, as a collective, and how you might be thinking about in that, in thinking about that in this moment um, as we think about the role of art in our culture? Well, you know, I think about, you know, right now and just sort of with the political climate that's, uh, that we're sort of in at the moment, I just think about like our history uh, being made a mockery of. And so for me, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just sort of trying to grasp the, uh, how that has been sort of used and portrayed. Uh, and at the same time, sort of thinking about the fatigue, uh, the sort of political sort of fatigue and emotional fatigue that I'm sort of trying to sort of understand uh, based on history uh, and trying to sort of uh, 
identify uh, mechanisms, tools, uh, conditionings that can sort of keep me in this sort of space of, of levelness in order to continue uh, moving my thoughts, my ideas forward. Uh, and I realize that I am lucky to have art as this vehicle, as this place to pour all of these emotions that I am carrying, that I am uh, faced with. Uh, and hopefully out of that becomes a new. Uh, but I am just really in this sort of space of just how my culture is being used in this sort of moment and uh, trying to stay ahead of all of that. The fatigue is real. The fatigue, I, you know, Nick and I are both in Chicago and we we definitely have spoken about this together and personally about what it means to also be in this moment, what it means to hold uh, all the pain of this moment, but also a historic trauma that we seem to never be able to shake off. But also, what does it really mean to hold that that kind of hope and resilience Uh that we've grown up with, that we know that our families have dealt with, and that we know culturally what it what it means to stay black in America, stay black and alive in America in many ways. This question of memory is also a really fascinating one for me, Thelma, um, and I, I'm glad you raise it because it's important to also recognize that memory is a part of history, even if it's not codified in a book or the archive, that that memory and that personal history becomes the way by which you still navigate the world. And it gives you a sense of possibility and work. I remember uh, very well the first work I'd seen of Howardina Pendel that's, I think, foundational for a lot of people. And that is the amazing video she made called Free White and 21. And I'd seen that video quite a few times where she talks about all these um, these really hurtful racist moments in her life. All these moments where she's encountered all sorts of resistance, um, unfair treatment, what have you. And it wasn't until about the 15th time I'd seen it that I realized she opens the story not with just her personal narrative, but with the story of her mother and how her mother had been burned in a lie bath because her mother's babysitter thought that um, Mrs. Pendell Elder was too dark and she tried to wash the color out of her skin that left her with a lifetime of burns. But it was incredible to me that Howardina almost told that story as if it was her own. And I began to ruminate at that moment of what does it mean to also inherit history? Not just live through it as a, a kind of present, but what does it mean to not inherit that story even inherit the pain, inherit that burn, and own a story like that. And I do believe that that's one of uh, the more fascinating things about, um, about what it means to also share histories right now, that we can begin to own each other's narratives and own each other's histories, not in a disrespectful way, to understand the world anew and understand what it means to inhabit a body, even if it's not our own. Now, I think that's uh, really amazing the way you frame that in terms of uh, memory. It reminds me of something a, a friend of mine, a filmmaker Lillian Jimenez, said to me almost three decades ago. Where she said she realized she had been living her parents' memories and that that had structured her life in a way. And, but she didn't have those memories. She was just living them. And I think your use of trauma is really important as part of that, to open up to the challenge of this moment is, in a way, uh, to sit with trauma. And that that is a challenge and a responsibility for everyone, to 
sit with that trauma, uh, not to solve it, uh, you know, pass an amendment, uh, you, know, you know, do these formal actions, but to sit with it. And that's really very hard to do because trauma takes you outside of language. You have memory, but you have an inability to experience it. It has pushed you out of that framework. And I think, you know, what you're saying about memory, it, it really shows that it, memory is not the alternative to history. And memory is no less complex than actual history, not stories that we accept. And I think we have to accept the fact that uh, for memory to be memory, it has to be extremely fluid. It has to have gaps in it. It has to be like, uh, you know, we're, we're using Zoom right now where you suddenly freeze up. <laughs> you, 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 you miss things. And I think the reason why it's important to realize it about history and memory is that the nationalist project of the 19th century creates history as a field by separating it from memory, by connecting it to the documents of the state. Uh, and later on, the oral histories or the memoirs of the men who ran the state. And that really narrows things down in terms of what history does. And uh, it, it, you can do the same thing with counter histories. You're basically creating a, a kind of sub-nationalist narrative. And you can do the same thing with a very romanticized notion of memory, like creating something very coherent uh, that serves that project. Uh, I think what's most fascinating is to really just, and most necessary, is like what I think you were saying, Naomi, is, is to sit with that trauma, but to also bring, what memory does is it brings us back into experience. It allows us to accept what we now understand about the past, about our own uh, position within that. So in terms of the question as, as it was posed by Thelma, I would say, we need to draw a distinction between remember, which is a nationalist imperative, remember the Alamo, and memory, which is something that you can never quite get your hand around. You can never quite lock into an object. Uh, it will never exist as a repeatable story. It will always change every time you tell it. And perhaps, Chan, in a way you frame that so beautifully, that the sort of complexity of how it can't be fixed is perhaps the experience many of us have with great works of art, right? That mm -hmm. we're being offered that opportunity to engage, to wrestle, to think, to reflect, because we cannot fix. And we're being offered memory, we're being offered history, we're being offered content and context, and all of those things are defined Right? in different ways, but it is then in the space of works of art through the vision yeah. of artists that we have a way to see the world right? and understand yeah. it in the present, look back at the past, but also perhaps the future. Well, we have a few moments left, and I would love from each of you, from the place that you sit, right, and, and you all occupy multiple roles, just as a way to end, to give us a sense of your idea, of your ideal, of the change narrative that you hope that we might see in the space of art, artworks, and museums in our future. I have to ask myself, where am I right now? Uh, what do I need right now in order for me to feel that I am being purposeful. And so for me, it's, I'm in this space right now where I can only do these projects that are purposeful. Uh, it has brought me to this sort of place because I think prior to George, George Floyd, I questioned my purpose through my practice. And so I am sort of uh, turning up that volume 
and shifting uh, my responsibility a bit. So I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about what, how I can be a contributor uh, to this world of art and, and, and history. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Nick in terms of this moment, and it's it's almost as if um, every day we f we wake up and there's a new evidence that the planet is joining in, uh, putting a thumb on the scale in terms of the social violence and the society that that has structured uh, as an untenable project. And what I find is, as I talk with people, is the first tendency of many people is to feel that they are in this alone, that what they're feeling is very personal. Not that um, the nature of our relations with all others, which are always there, are being called into question and we're being given a challenge. Uh, as Nick says, you know, what is the purpose? How do we move forward? Uh, I really liked what you said, Thelma, about art, and it reminded me of the first time I heard a fugue. It was Andre Segovia. I was at a, I was a kid, and I was at a concert, and he started playing a Bach fugue, and I felt like my head was splitting in half, and yet it was still my head. And I think that I find that in the work that truly moves me, in the work that I think um, maintains a, a, an ongoing challenge to viewers, to people that engage with the work. And that that is the great potential. And what it says is that there's not the narrative. We're not changing the narrative. We have to change into multiple narratives. We have to change into a world that can live with difference, internal to an individual, to a family, and to a society that doesn't look like that individual or that family. Uh, but is truly uh, who we are. And I think as a, as a scholar and as a curator, I try to find those works that challenge me to take some of that back into my own work. I don't think it's very useful as a, as a critic or as a curator to stand there and say, I now understand this, I'm positioning it, I'm putting it into an, a, an enclosed, defined space and I'm telling you what it's all about so that the critic can come in and do the same thing. I think, but that's the way the profession's set up. And you get a lot of pushback when you break that framework, a didactic framework. A lot of pushback, even when what you do really turns out to be quite successful and very popular. It's not the way the profession understands how you do things. But to create that is to create the space that Nick spoke about at the very beginning, a space that invites people in who are not all alike and who can talk. And they can talk to the work and they can talk to each other. And ideally you come out of that space, uh, not back into society, but with a slightly changed understanding of what society is and, you, and where you fit within it. And I think that's what great art does. I think we have kept a lot of great art out of the galleries and we need to bring more of it in and put it into dialogue with what's already there and have them take each other apart. Yes, well, thank you for that. I think, you know, we can speak of many institutions where that has already been the charge, but certainly Crystal Bridges is one. And we've had that mm -hmm. experience of when all the yes. art is brought into the gallery allowed to exist uh, together as a way to see and know uh, the complexity of our history. And Naomi. You know, John really stole the words from me, um, firstly that there is no one history to confront. There are multiple histories, multiple narratives. And if it's been my charge as a curator, and one that I've learned at your knee too, Thelma, is that our job is to recuperate many stories, uh, many objects, many ways of practicing into this larger thing that we call both the art historical canon, but a social ideal as well. I also have learned through art to be comfortable with not knowing things 
And one of the great joys of curating is that you can encounter a work over and over again and learn something new. You can encounter a body of work over and over again and learn something new each time. You can have multiple conversations with, with an artist and still come to a broader understanding each time. And that we leave a record now for someone else to do that same work in the future, to find new stories that we left behind. We can't foreclose history ever in the moment that we're in, but we only leave something for someone else to work on. And that, I think, is the challenge always of the profession and of institutions. Thank you. I want to thank all three of you, Naomi, Nick, Chan, for this amazing conversation. I want to thank our colleagues at Crystal Bridges for not only the context of State of the Art in the Summit, but also Nick's amazing exhibition as the frame by which we could spend this time together this afternoon. And thank all of those who are watching. Um, we appreciate your interest and we want to wish you all the opportunity to find the power and possibility in works of art.